The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection with Al Page. Our guest is Professor Grant Hildebrand from the College of Architecture at the University of Washington. What's the difference between, What's art, the difference and between art and architecture? Oh, gosh. I think the interesting side of architecture probably is the art side, but it's an art that has an awful lot of pragmatic things going on, structure and the need to house things as this room does, the need what, to actually provide a function. What makes it art? What makes architecture art? That leads us into a long question. I think we respond to the forms, the spaces that it takes on, the colorations, the scale that it yields for us. And I think, in fact, that that's far more important than people imagine who dismiss it as just appearance. I think it's really gut stuff. It's That leads directly into my own field, which is the relation between evolutionary biology and architectural space. We choose habitats, we choose spaces, and that to me is uh, nicely caught between art and science, actually. It's impossible to say which it is. It's genetic programming for choosings of things, and I think it's very powerful stuff. Are there some kind of spaces that we're just innately comfortable with? Sure, they're what we picked 200,000 years ago to raise our young. Give us some examples. Well, I'm heavily involved right now in Frank Lloyd Wright's houses, which have been really odd things because in some ways they're just terrible houses. They just don't work. In many of them you can't arrange furniture, the closets are inadequate, the roofs leak, but they have a very powerful draw. The people who built them love them and people go to see them and are enchanted by them. And I've been involved for the last couple of years in making a tie between the ways he makes his houses and the way we chose habitation way back when. What are your conclusions? The relation, the correlation is dead on. They are in a very rich set of ways. They're exactly the way that we started out as surviving species in choosing ways to live, places to live. They're dead on to that. I think it was all intuitive. I don't think he had any conscious grasp of it, but I think he had a highly whetted intuition for what just goes straight to the intuitive choice of space. Nothing cognitive, just this is what we like and that's where we're going. Be more specific, what is it we like? The central fireplace under a low ceiling which makes a kind of cozy cave and then beyond that the expanses of glass that lead out to the terrace, the hunting ground, the meadow beyond which we can move to or retreat from at will. We've got all these sort of primordial choices right there. And so far as I can tell, except in the last few years when a couple of architects are beginning, again intuitively, to do the same kind of thing, no one else came close to right in doing just that set of relationships. The deep pocketed fire, the cave, the warmth, the nurturing, and then the opening of the space beyond, and then finally the opening of the house to the land. Uh, Gordon Orion, so this campus, I think, would say it's the grove at the edge of the savanna with the cave behind it. We were talking earlier before we started about Tom Wolfe, and he and others have argued that modern architecture has gotten away from some of the things that you've talked about, that it's too cold. I think it did. And Wolfe, of course, isn't the only one to say so. It's pretty commonplace now to throw barbs at modern architecture. But, uh, yeah, I think it did get away from that. Um, it was after an ideology of some kind of social change, some new world vision, and that was contributive. It did an awful lot, and people who carp at it forget the really wonderful things that came out of that. But you pick and choose, and it gave up some things, and I think it gave up some very important things. We talked about art at the beginning. Would you consider Wright an artist? Oh, yes, no question. But when, when I talk about the way he's an artist, that takes us straight back to the social sciences. <laughs> so is it art or science? And that's the fun of it. It's neither one. But that raises another interesting question. Is it personality or training that determines how talented an architect might become? Oh, gosh. I think it's both. I suppose that's true in any field. Um, there's something in it that's 
inborn, I think. Uh, I've always been interested in music, and if I had my druthers, I'd like to be an opera singer, a Pavarotti or something, but I can't, and no amount of education will make me that. I don't have, that's beyond me, it can't be done. And I think the same, but I could be taught to sing a lot better than I do, and I think my wife wishes <laughs> that I would be taught to sing better than I do. Uh, I think the same is true in architecture. I hope we can help people and bring talent along and provide competence where talent isn't there, but I'm sure there's a component that is. But you're almost forced to argue that with Wright, it's the force of his personality that dominates, that comes through. I think in his case that's true, yes. Objectively, is there such a thing as good architecture, or is everything we're talking about simply subjective? No, I don't think it's entirely subjective. I think there's an element of subjectivity in it, but uh, I think that many of these things are relatively pervasive. Uh, is there such a thing as good music? Well, we agree that there is, and we agree that it follows certain orders that we understand, and within that we may choose we may value one kind of music more than another, but um, we all agree that music is different from noise. But specifically, what are the factors that make for good architecture? I think they are similar to some of the other arts. Uh, order and complexity within that order, which is what we find enjoyable in poetry or music. Kane Hall is sort of an instance. Sue's Low Library across the way is another one. This sets up an order of columns. Uh, Suzelo does that, but overlays that with a much more complex fabric, and we find an innate delight, I think, in understanding that this is ordered, and then the eye is teased, as it is in poetry or music, to discover all the permutations of that. It's one instance, I think there are others, and we may like uh, the Parthenon better than Suzelo Library, but we know that they are both architecture and not noise. Let's go downtown, downtown Seattle. Do we find order or do we find chaos? I <laughs> You've picked a poor example. I think we find a lot of chaos. Uh huh. Too much. Too much. And if you compare it with Venice, which we pay a lot of money to go to, or a Cotswold Village, the level of order in those settings is far greater. And I think we delight in that and find a satisfaction. And I think, I hope, we're beginning to understand that about urban design and about architecture so that uh, we do get somewhere and make Seattle closer to those examples. But I think it's highly chaotic. There must be something that you like downtown. What's good downtown? I live right in the middle of downtown, and there's a lot of it I like. Uh, the trite examples, the square and the market, are easy ones. but. The uh, Northern Life Tower, now called the Seattle Tower, I think it's a wonderful building. Uh, a lot of little tiny things, and there are things going on now that I find delightful. A lot of little spots of greenery that uh, zone just to the, on the west edge of the Interstate Bank building that has the sort of slinky toy el escalator. That, that's becoming a very rich little spot. Uh, the roof of the library, which is a dull building itself, now has got a kind of micro space that one can enjoy. The Seafirst Plaza has come a very long way in the last couple of years toward being a delightful space. And I enjoy all those things. I'm terribly frightened by the scale and the congestion that scale will bring in the current overbuilding of the city. There's a lot I like downtown. I'm very excited by lots of it. You mentioned overbuilding. Do you think we're overbuilding downtown? I think we are. Um, we are one of very few cities in the whole country uh, that allows the density we allow. No other city on the coast can uh, allow skyscrapers of the mass and height that we allow. Only the Texas cities and perhaps L.A. The densities we allow are greater th even than Times Square in Manhattan. And uh, I think that's too much for our street system. We don't have in place any kind of mass transit system that's going to handle that. People think that congestion downtown is bad now, but they think it will be alleviated when the streets are back in place and the construction stops. In the first place, construction's not going to stop for a while. And in the second place, the towers, if they fill, will bring as I have the figures, 29,000 vehicle trips a day, a line of cars 55 miles long, 
and that's the streets will never be better than they are today and with it what you and I were talking about a little earlier the shortness of human temper and tolerance and patience that I think are going to make Seattle a different place from what I liked about it. I worry about that. We're talking about the effect of a series of building codes. Do these codes really reflect the input of architects and urban planners, or are they the end result of a political process? That's a really loaded question, and I get into trouble trying to answer it. It probably is both. Allied Arts of Seattle, for instance, was allowed extensive responses to the new comprehensive plan in draft form, and they made extensive responses. Uh, my observation is that almost all of their responses were rejected. Uh, I think, my own view, it was driven rather heavily by developmental pressures and by a need to, what, accept those as a part of modern city form. I think it was overly driven by development pressures. Others probably would disagree. I think it was inadequately driven by responses such as those made by architects, allied arts, other what one might call disinterested bodies in the process. Um, I think the ire of both the neighborhoods and aspects of the downtown community are beginning to show that. How do you handle the critics who say the architects, the urban planners, don't understand that if you don't have this density, you can't provide enough jobs for the urban poor, service jobs? Yeah, I don't see that we're supporting them especially well, even with the overbuilding. I don't much see the relationship there. I think there is something to be said for a dense city, provided you take advantage of the potential it's got to offer, which is short circulation paths, therefore minimal traffic, and a minimal use of arable land. But we're not taking advantage of those. We have a, an overbuilt city with suburban traffic problems feeding into it and a use of arable land in King County at a fantastically increasing rate. So the potential of a dense city isn't happening, to my mind. And I don't see, then, the benefits it is supposed to yield for the urban poor or for amelioration of traffic, it seems to me the advantages it's, it's yielding are confined to a very small segment of the population, that is, the developer, the land holder. Is there any theme to downtown, any theme at all that ties the diverse communities downtown and those various buildings together? I don't know what you mean by anything. I think there are a couple instances of very fine architectural quality the new Washington Mutual Tower is one of them, what has been going under 1201 Third title at Third and Seneca. And I think the new art museum is going to be a wonderful building. Um, the problem isn't with individual buildings or individual architectural quality, it's the aggregate of them. Let's turn to Bellevue. How are they doing architecturally? Should we beat up on them too? Oh, gosh, I, I really have to tell you I'm not knowledgeable enough about Bellevue to answer that. I get out there now and again, but I'm really a Seattle person. I live downtown, and that's where my mind's at. I uh, go out to the Bellevue Art Museum occasionally, and I go out there occasionally to do, I'm ashamed to say, some shopping. <laughs> but I can't speak knowledgeably about Bellevue. I'd be over my head. What about Portland? What about Vancouver? Do they do things differently than we do? Do they have a different feel about them? They have, <coughs> they have more restrictive codes. The density we allow, they don't allow. Half what we allow. And um, I think that Portland has turned out to be an absolutely delightful city. I enjoy it enormously. It may be in part the reduced density. They've made some moves toward accommodation of transit that not only work, but are extraordinarily handsome. I don't know a city on the face of the earth that has nicer looking bus signs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Vancouver is kind of traditionally held up by the Seattleite, I suppose, as a model that Seattle ought to emulate. I like it too. Uh, its gas town seems to be more extensive and in some ways more interesting than Pioneer Square. And what it does in working its coastline, 
is a handsome set of moves. I don't think they got the mileage from the fair that they expected. That seems to me to be not one of the more successful parts of town. But yes, I like Vancouver and Portland. I like Portland especially. I think it's a wonderful city. In Portland, you've talked about transportation and density. But what other factors really make Portland interesting? Uh, reverence and more reverence for older buildings? A lot of reverence for some a really fine heritage of older buildings. You can argue that Portland had a lot of luck going for it over time. It's had a fund of what moneyed population for a long period of time, far longer than Seattle, and that's built a lot of quality into it. And uh, it's made a few bold moves lately. The uh, Portland Building by Michael Graves is a famous one, and I think it's got its flaws, but it was a bold gesture. It was trying something, and Seattle doesn't often do that. We're trying that with our art museum, but we don't often do it. The building right across from the Portland Building, I think, is a gem by, um, oh gosh, I'm terribly embarrassed to say, uh, Frasca, Robert Frasca, I think primarily the designer. It's a wonderful building, the Justice Building. You've talked about a number of interesting buildings in Seattle and in Portland. Is there such a thing as Northwest architecture, or are all these buildings diverse? I wonder. Uh, on the residential scale, we sort of know what Northwest architecture means, woodsy things. At the larger urban scale, it's a little harder to find. I talk about regionalism in my classes. Doug Kelbaugh is very interested in it, as you know, but it seems to me it's an elusive concept. The topography, the way the first interstate tower has fun with the idea of a steep street, one could call particular to ourselves, couldn't happen in Detroit or Portland, but the rest of the tower could be anywhere. That's a complicated question. I fuss with it a lot, and I don't know that I've got an answer yet. Let's shift to the neighborhoods. Are we ruining the neighborhoods? I think the neighborhoods would say so. I think I would say so. A lot of very ticky-tacky housing going in. Again. A lot of overscaled. The, the new NC2 zoning allows for densities of office and, and sheer height development that I think the neighborhoods are just beginning to understand. Much of Roosevelt up by the reservoir could be buildings as high as 65 feet in office and retail development, which is going to utterly change, and I think change for the worse, the character of that neighborhood. Ballard is concerned about the same kind of thing, so is the East Lake District. It's, it's a drastic change in scale. Should neighborhoods in Vancouver or Seattle or Portland have the right to control the architecture in their own neighborhood? I think they should have some right, yes. I would speak, I suppose, for a large right. One of the things I enjoyed so much about Seattle in coming here many years ago from Detroit was the character and the definability of neighborhoods. I think they have a right to continue that. It's something of enormous value. It doesn't happen in very many American cities. The neighborhoods are concerned about losing it, and I share their concern. Should the architecture of neighborhoods reflect their ethnic background? That's hard. I don't see that Ballard is any more Scandinavian than East Lake. Uh, I don't see that the International District is architecturally any more oriental than Pioneer Square. The architecture of Seattle tends by, and except for the trite stuff, the signage and so forth, tends to be a melding thing. And that one seems hard for me to maintain. But Ballard certainly does have a kind of scale and texture that, whether it's Scandinavian or not, is Ballard. Let's talk a bit about the future in architecture. We hear a lot of terms like modernism, postmodernism. Are those accurate terms? Can you really define trends in architecture? A lot of people have uh, doubts about postmodernism, have from the beginning. I think it's a movement that served us as a transition and a liberating sort of thing, but I think it's probably about run its course. Now I'll be proved wrong, but that's what I think. But what is postmodernism? Huh, hard to say. It almost defined itself in negatives, uh, being not what modernism was. It was an attempt to loosen the palette considerably, to bring elements of history, richness, wit, complexity, 
Um, so to move away from simply cold to contemporary move away, boxes. Yes, but I don't think it had the sort of uh, cohesive idealism that modernism had for all its faults. You've probably gathered my biases. I see meaning and value re-understood in architecture through the things I'm interested in, but then so does everyone, the, the biological connection and understanding of what meaning really is in, in our responses to space and form seems to me to be the next path worth following. That Others would disagree, that's my bias. I'm very excited by that prospect. But how does that translate to an office building? We started out by talking about the fire in a cave and Frank Lloyd Wright and human sort of a human scale. It's hard to figure out how that translates into a 50-story office building. It okay. is, and I'm not sure I'm there yet, although we do have some instances around Seattle that begin to suggest that the warehouse or administrative headquarters in Federal Way, for instance, is an office building that in many ways conforms to my model of what I think humanistic spaces can be. And my sense is that it's a very well-liked building. Uh, I live in a condominium tower in the middle of downtown, a multi-story building, and my condominium happens by pure accident to be a rare case of conformity in a high-rise, uh, not a detached single-family dwelling. I think, too, in other aspects, restaurants or something, some of my students have probed in terms of how these humanistic preferences happen. So I think it goes beyond the detached single-family dwelling. I'm not sure how far yet it goes beyond that. A lot of unanswered things. But I'm not at all going to say that it's just a single-family detached dwelling issue. I think it's beyond that already. But if you have to think about what buildings are going to look like 20, 30, 40 years from now, do you think they'll go back to the modern boxes or will they reflect the sort of more romantic things we're beginning to see appearing on the scene? I think that romanticism, it's not a bad word, I think will persist. The um, Washington Mutual Tower, the 1201 third thing, has had more positive reaction by the man in the street than any building that I can remember in Seattle. It seems to be enormously well-liked. And it's rich, one could almost call it romantic, the bronze urns that look like something out of the best of the 19th century. Um, I think the sheer liking of those buildings will uh, have an economic value and will have a developer satisfying value that will perpetuate them. One always gets a range of quality, but my guess is that those kinds of characteristics maybe are back with us to stay for a fair while. One has the impression that in at least some areas American products have become shoddy. Is American building becoming shoddy? Gosh, depends on who you're comparing it with. Um, you're smiling. I, yeah. <laughs> so, so something obviously is coming yeah, to mind. Well, I was just thinking, I taught in Japan a few years ago, and uh, the buildings there are made like watches. <laughs> And I was just so impressed with the craft, and by that, and that's a high standard. By that comparison, we probably don't come up to it. But again, to return to the example we've taken on, the, uh, the Washington Mutual Tower, or I think the New Art Museum, they're exquisitely crafted things by the standards of what's happening typ typically in Europe, for instance. Uh, I think they're exquisitely crafted by the standards of what's happening in the Eastern United States. Good stuff, beautifully made, beautifully made. Walk by the uh, Washington Mutual Tower and look at the detailing, it's exquisitely done. Durable, fine materials, beautifully conjoined. So this is one field we don't have to worry about. I don't think that's where our problems lie. Let's shift the subject. Why did you go into architecture? Oh gosh, <laughs> why did I, I wonder. Uh, my father was a painter and sculptor, and he got involved in some architectural projects, and I suppose I just really kind of enjoyed it from that point of view, I'm not sure, and started out in engineering in college and uh, decided that wasn't what I wanted to do, and I went over to the College of Architecture and Design at Michigan. I was timid at the time, I suppose I still am, and uh, 
I went to the desk and I said, I'd like to talk to someone about transferring to architecture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what I wanted was to talk to someone, and the secretary thought I wanted to transfer, and she put the forms in front of me, and I was too shy to say, no, I didn't want to sign them, so I signed them. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I'm in architecture, and I've loved it. I wouldn't be anywhere else. It, it was a wonderful happenstance decision, but it, I, it wasn't something I mulled over for years. When you went into your first architecture classes, how did they differ from engineering classes? Color, form, aesthetics, uh, the smell of oil paint, the fun of doing watercolors, uh, the interest of shaping things that people would wander through and look at. And <coughs> it was all a long time ago, but I do remember those excitements. Do you still have that excitement? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I sure do. Mm -hmm. When you walk through downtown and see a building that you really <laughs> like, do you still react to it emotionally? Yeah, I do. I do, and I think that everyone in considerable degree does. I don't think it's just me. Yeah, yeah I love that aspect of it. I still do. I still find it thrilling. I still find it's fun to encounter a student who has that same thrill or to try to impart that thrill to a student. So you're still having fun? Yep, you bet. Professor Grant Hildebrand from the College of Architecture at the University of Washington, upon reflection. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org classics.